Hi everybody, welcome to Grace Walk. I'm glad to have you join me today. We are talking on this program about the grace that the Bible refers to the faith once delivered to the saints. Not the contaminated 21st century version of grace. You know, people warn you about grace these days. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? There are actually people out there that warn you about grace. They'll say, you better watch out for those hyper-grace teachers as if it's something to be afraid of. Let me tell you, you can't go too far with grace. And those that tell you you can go too far with grace, with all due respect, they don't understand grace. Because grace is the divine enablement by the life of Christ in us for us to be all that we've been called to be and do all that we've been called to do. You don't have to be scared you're going to go too far with grace. Sometimes people say, well... You know, grace is good, but you got to keep that in balance. Really? In balance with what? In balance with legalism? Grace needs no balance. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. You don't put grace on one side of the line and truth on the other side of the line as if they stand in contrast to each other. Grace and truth stand on the same side of the line and they reside in the person of Jesus Christ. So I'm telling you plainly, don't listen to somebody who tells you to be careful not to go too far with grace. Now, hear me. Can you abuse grace? Can you disavow grace? Can you insult grace? Can you overrun grace and live and talk and act in a way that does not align with the grace of the Bible? Of course you can. But that doesn't mean you've gone too far with grace. What that means is you've now moved into disgrace. You're acting against grace. And I know there are, you know, speakers and teachers and magazines and publications and articles you'll find everywhere these days that caution you about going too far with grace. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Let me tell you what, you better be careful of them. Because what they're doing is they're peddling with the currency of the legalistic world of religion, which is fear. They're trying to make you afraid that you might jump ship, that you might go too far. I've even heard folks say, you know, if you embrace this whole grace thing, next thing you know, you're out there living a life of sin and you, you're, you're not following Christ and you're throwing away your Bible and you don't believe anybody needs to trust Christ and you've abandoned the idea of heaven and hell and all that. They're just trying to alarm you. They're trying to create a sense of fear in you. Don't buy into that. Don't buy into that at all. I'll tell you straight up. The Bible says the grace of God has appeared to all men teaching us, grace teaches you, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and how to live sober, righteous, and just in this present age. You show me somebody who acts like you know, a fool and they go out there and they live this wild, wicked lifestyle and they call it grace and I'll show you somebody who doesn't understand grace but rather they're expressing disgrace. On the other hand, you show me some Pharisee who says, well, you better be careful about grace because if you go too far with grace, you're going to end up being the one who's out there. Now I'll show you another person on the opposite side who doesn't understand grace either. Grace is a person. Grace is a person named Christ. Grace is unilateral. Grace is the idea that, that Christ has done it all for us. I mean, Christ has done it. It's, it's unilateral. It, we respond to grace, but we don't do anything to cause it. We don't do anything to provoke it. Even right down to the issue of our salvation, it's Christ who does it all. Now, let me get back into the study that we've been in over the last few weeks as we've talked about this whole idea of justification and faith. I've told you before that uh, the faith of Christ is sufficient. And we have been justified by Christ. You know, in the modern church world, you are told that you're justified by your belief, right? People say, well, you're justified when you believe. But did you know the book of Romans, Paul, the, the grace apostle, that wrote more than half the New Testament. In the book of Romans in chapter 5, he says we've been justified by his blood. So I'm just going to say it very plainly because I'm old enough I really don't care much anymore what folks think. I'm just going to say it plainly. These legalistic teachers out there telling you that you're justified by your belief in Jesus Christ, they're insulting the blood of Christ. 
They're an enemy of the cross. Because Paul the apostle said, you have been justified by his blood. And yet legalism says, no, 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 no. You're well, his blood's important. Let's not minimize that. Yes, his blood's important, but you're justified when you believe. You're justified by your belief. No, that's not what the Bible says. You're justified by the blood. This is not some cooperative effort where we have to do our part. Or it, it got, on the cross, Jesus didn't die on the cross and at the final end say, okay, your move. Your move. No. When Jesus died on the cross, the last thing he said was, well, not the last thing, but one of the sayings was, it is finished. Do you need to believe it? Yes, of course you need to believe it. All the religionists out there that are scared somebody might get off scot-free and not do enough panic when I say Jesus did it all or anybody says it because they say, well, he did it all, but he did it all, but, well, we won't talk about that. Because Jesus did do it all, <clears throat> we do believe it, but our belief is a response to what he has done. So we've looked together in scripture and we've looked together in church history at what different folks have said and if you've been tracking with me, you know we've come to the place where we have said that it is not our faith that justifies us. It's not our faith in Christ, but it is the faith of Christ that justifies us. It's the faith of Christ. It's what He's done, not what we've done. So now, do you believe that? Because that's the gospel. The gospel is not about you putting your faith in Him. The gospel is about the faithfulness of Christ and what He has done on your behalf and on behalf of all humanity. So let's believe that. Now, we're going we're gonna to look today at one of the early, in, in just a moment, I'm going to show you the, one of the early leaders of the church. His name was Athanasius. And we're going to talk about him after the break and how he, he made it so very clear that... Uh, it is the faith of Christ that puts us in a right standing with God. He's done it all. So let's take a break. And after we come back, I want to jump right into some old church history, move forward, some, move backwards some centuries into history and let you see what he says about faith in Christ. We'll be back right after this. Unlock the secrets of the quantum world and discover how to experience a deeper connection to the Kingdom of God with the revolutionary book, Quantum Life. Through exploring the cutting-edge science of quantum mechanics and its connection to biblical truth, best-selling author Steve McVeigh reveals a new way of understanding our place in the Kingdom of God and how that impacts our daily experiences. Whether you're a sincere Christ follower or just curious about the mysteries of the universe, this book is a helpful guide to unlocking a new level of understanding and experiencing the fullness of life you were made to know and enjoy. Quantum Faith takes readers on a groundbreaking journey that bridges the gap between science and faith. Combining the latest discoveries in quantum physics with timeless biblical wisdom, this captivating book reveals profound insights into the nature of how faith functions inside the Kingdom of God. With meticulous scientific research and sound biblical application, Steve McVeigh explores five scientific realities that not only affirm the validity of biblical teachings, but also empowers readers to deepen their faith and experience transformative encounters. Prepare to embark on an awe-inspiring exploration that will revolutionize the way you perceive the world, inviting you to embrace a quantum faith that unlocks infinite possibilities.
know, in the second century, <clears throat> Irenaeus talked about how that the finished work of Christ accompanied or influenced everybody, everybody on the planet. Everybody was joined to God through what Christ did, said Irenaeus in the second century. But if we come forward a few uh, centuries, Athanasius stands at the front and center of the church and he affirms what Irenaeus had said some centuries earlier. Listen to Athanasius. We're talking about the fact that Jesus did it. It's his finished work, not your belief that makes it true. Listen to what Irena I mean, what uh, Athanasius said. He said, naturally also through this union of the immortal Son of God with our human nature, all people were clothed with incorruption in the promise of the resurrection. For the solidarity of humanity is such that by virtue of the words indwelling in a single human body, the corruption which goes with death has lost its power over all. You know how it is when some great king enters a large city and dwells in one of its houses. Because of his dwelling in that single house, the whole city is honored, and enemies and robbers cease to molest it. Even so is it with the king of all. He has come into our country and dwelt in one body amidst the many, and in consequence, the designs of the enemy against humanity have been foiled and the corruption of death which formerly held them in its power has simply ceased to be. For the human race would have perished utterly had not the Lord and Savior of all, the Son of God, come among us to put an end to death. <laughs> it's pretty clear, don't you think? Athanasius, early church leader, so, when Jesus died, it was His faith, or to fine-tune it even more, it was His faithfulness that solved Adam's problem. Do you understand this concept that when Jesus, as the last Adam, went to the cross, He scooped up all humanity in His arms, and all of Adam's depraved, darkened, dismal, defeated race went to the cross with him so that everybody died in Christ. There are teachers out there that say, well, you're in Adam. You're in Adam until you put your faith in Christ. You stay in Adam and then, you, then, then, you go, then you're put into Christ. You move into Christ when you believe. Whoa, 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 wait, wait. The Bible says it is by His doing that you are in Christ. That's, that's what the Scripture says. It is by His doing that you're in Christ. You've always been in Christ. It's not your belief that puts you there. Let, let's, look at a, let's look at this text. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 8. Look at this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus or Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death. Therefore we've been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Does it get any clearer than that? We died with Christ. Everybody died with Christ. Adam died with Christ. Adam's race died with Christ. I know somebody's going to tell you that McVeigh guy's wrong. I'm just showing you the Bible. They're going to say, you're, you're, you're taken out of Adam and put into Christ when you believe. Really? Well, then what about where the Bible says that all died with Christ? Yeah. One of one that I've enjoyed reading is a Scottish Bible teacher from years gone by. His name is William Steele. Here's what he said about it. Listen to his explanation. 
There Paul repeats the truth verse after verse in varying forms of words. We're baptized into his death. We're planted together in the likeness of his death. Our old man was crucified with him. He that is dead has been justified from sin. We are dead with Christ. Could anything be more plain? Paul says that when Jesus died, we died with him. The Negro spiritual is not wrong when it asks, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? We were all there. But we must take time to ponder it. Does it mean that when Jesus died on the cross, we all died to sin with him before we were born? The answer can only be yes. Although the actualizing of the fact awaits our birth and our conversion, the only way to grapple with the fact is to let this incredible statement strike home to our hearts with stark and daring force. <laughs> well, Mr. Steele, you nailed it. You nailed it. Some people say, well, no, you get right with God when you believe on Christ. I mean, we're taken out of Adam and placed into Christ when we believe. Well, what do you do with the Apostle Paul's description of our origination in him? He says we were chosen in Christ long before we believed in Him. In fact, Paul says we were chosen in Him before we were even born. I mean, there's a verse that makes this point clear. Take special note of it. Take special note of this verse. It says this. This is the Bible. You believe your Bible? Listen. He chose us in Him, Christ, before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. That's Ephesians 1.4. Another translation renders the verse this way. Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. So then it wasn't our choice of Him that put us into Christ. It was Him choosing us. <laughs> we were chosen in Christ before anything was even created. When then do you find your origin in Christ? Was it when you said a prayer? When you believed? No. Your origin in Him precedes time and space reaching all the way back into eternity. Let's take a break and we'll say more about that right after this. Prayer is a powerful tool, but many have wondered how to strengthen their prayer lives. Quantum Prayer offers a thought-provoking exploration of the potential connections and spiritual implications between the mysterious world of quantum mechanics and Christian prayer. This book delves into various quantum concepts such as non-locality, entanglement, superposition, and seven other scientific principles examining how they might complement and equip people to pray more effectively. If you are looking for a book that will challenge your thinking and deepen your spiritual journey, Quantum Prayer is a must read. It offers a new and thought-provoking perspective on prayer. It explores the potential connections between quantum mechanics and Christian faith. It provides specific and practical insights on how to pray more effectively. It is written in a clear and engaging style and easy to understand, even for those who have no previous exposure to quantum science. Buy your copy now and discover the power of quantum prayer. Has the liberating message of grace touched your life and transformed you in your own grace walk? The Grace Walk Experience community invites you to join us in an online group of friends who are dedicated to experiencing the kind of life we were born to know and enjoy. Life is meant to be rich and purposeful, not dull or constrained by past pains, legalistic religion, or limiting beliefs. With our daily teachings, bi-weekly live online gatherings, and ongoing engagement, we are moving forward together in grace. You love the message, now join the movement. Come to gracewalkexperience.com and subscribe now.
The scripture makes it very clear that you've always been in Christ. Always. The verse I read to you just a few moments ago says that before the foundation of the world, you were in Christ. So now listen, if you were, listen to this, if you were, like the Bible says, if you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, then didn't you have to be in Christ before the foundation of the world? So why then are you going to believe somebody who tells you you're put into Christ when you trust Him? You've already been put into Christ before the foundation of the world. It simply becomes your experience, your, your aware, recognized, subjective experience when you believe it before one of Adam's race showed our face on this planet. God had already chosen us in Christ and dealt with the problem of sin in the eternal realm, even before the first taint of sin entered the world. <laughs> now, somebody was going to say, is he saying everybody's in Christ? I don't want to be misunderstood. So let me be very clear. I'm saying everybody and everything is in Christ. That's what the Bible says in Colossians 1. Let me read you a translation, Young's literal translation, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It, pro it proves, it gives clear proof of this fact. Listen to this. Because in him were the all things created, I know it reads awkward, but this is where it reads, those in the heavens and those upon the earth, those visible and those invisible, whether thrones, whether lordships, whether principalities, whether authorities, all things through him and for him have been created, and himself is before all, and the all things in him have consisted. I know, that's kind of, kind of a freaky sentence structure, kind of weird, awkward in places, but it's the literal translation. And the literal translation says that it was in Him that everything in existence was created. Jesus Christ is the creator. He's the matrix, the source, the a sustainer of everything in existence. That last phrase in verse 17, it says, The all things in Him have consisted. Everything that exists is held together in Him. Just relax. You can chill out because you're at home in Him. And nothing exists or happens outside of Him. I'm not saying that everybody has a conscious relationship to Christ because they don't. I'm not saying everybody's a Christian or a believer because they're not. But this verse does clearly show that everybody and everything is related to Him through a union about which they may or may not possess knowledge. When it says He is before all things, it doesn't refer to priority like number one, but it refers to placement. It refers to His immediate presence in the whole cosmos. There's no distance between God and man. Any perception of distance is an illusion caused by the whispering lies of ghosts from Adam's shadowy past, still haunting people who just haven't seen the light of the gospel yet. What happens when people don't know the truth of the gospel? Well, they live their lives based on this life separation. Paul described it. He said it this way. He said, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Without knowing the truth, the default setting will be to live the lie. Unbelievers are living out of a lie and they're not walking in the truth. The truth is that what Jesus did, He did for everybody and the success of it doesn't depend on our agreement. It didn't happen when we believed, but when we were still dead and incapable of, of believing, said Paul. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6 says, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
So, which is it? Is it the work of Jesus Christ or the response of man that brings the benefits of the cross into existence? Grace would insist that it's His work and not our response that gave birth to those things. Faith in Christ certainly links us to the reality, but there'd be nothing to link us too if it weren't already real beforehand. We are reconciled. You've always been in Christ. And it's for that reason that we can be reconciled. <laughs> you are in Christ and nothing's ever interfered with that. You've always been in Christ. God has reconciled the world to Himself. It's not something that we accomplish by our faith. I'm going to wrap it up today by saying once again, yes, you need to believe it. If somebody gave you a million dollars and you didn't believe it, would the million dollars help you? Of course not. But I want you to see that you've always been in Christ and God loves you because you've been made accepted in Christ. He's not angry with you. It's not contingent on a proper response on your part. It's because of His goodness. There's no doubt that an improper response or even no response will impact your life in a negative way, in ways that are too many to number, but when you turn your attention to Christ and you trust in Christ, <laughs> that divine love then transforms you. So believe it. You're in. You're in. Good news. Gospel, you're in because of Him. Well, I hope that you will wrestle with and allow the spirit of truth to guide you into a deeper understanding of these things. And uh, I look forward to connecting with you again next time on Grace Walk. Until then, come on over to my website at Steve McVeigh, M-C-V-E-Y, stevemcveigh.com and join me there. And just keep on going and I'll see you again next time. Be blessed.